Okay, you know who you are. I'm talking about those of you here who are PCC students. Those of you who are in the process of successfully navigating your academic course plan at Portland Community College. I've been teaching here in the psychology department at PCC for 35 years, uh, 28 years over at Sylvania, and the last eight over here at Southeast. And my heart is with Southeast Center. The time I spend with my students is not just in the classroom, and that's partly probably because of my discipline a little bit, but it's also because of the kinds of assessments I require of my students. So I've spent hundreds of hours individually talking about their different projects and assessments that they're doing, advising, mentoring, hearing your personal stories, um, your educational stories. It's pretty amazing. So you know who you are. And I know a little bit about who you are, too. You're people who've dealt with significant challenges and adversity in your lives. And you know what I'm referring to when I talk about that. I'm talking about those of you who are first-generation college students. You know, that's not easy. You're the first person in your family to go to college. You're kind of lost. It's a little bit like being in the wilderness sometimes, but you're doing it. And you're changing history for yourselves and for your family. I'm talking about those of you with various cultural and language differences that you've had to adapt to. Those of you who are recovering from drug and alcohol or sexual addictions. Those of you who are starting over after coming out of prison. Those of you who are dealing with various learning and physical disabilities, working and going to school and being single parents, adjusting to and recreating your lives as veterans, exploring and expressing your sexual orientation or gender identity, which may differ from the norm, overcoming years of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, and dealing with the effects of previous lack of education in so many ways. So in spite of these challenges, you continue to thrive and grow and kind of surf the wave of your education in your lives with integrity, grace, creativity, and humor. Passion. I wholeheartedly acknowledge all of you. But in spite of everyone's best efforts, we know that not all students are successful here. They get overwhelmed or discouraged. They lack the cycle hardiness it takes to survive or thrive. They lack the emotional or material for social resources needed to achieve their goals. So what is it about the students who make it, those who conscientiously commit to their goals and continue to adapt to and or master the challenges that come their way? Today, I want to talk about four characteristics that, according to research, are predictors of success academically and in life experience. The successful students I work with every day consistently demonstrate one or more of these qualities. And I am very passionate about what I do, and so some of this is very moving to me. It um, has an effect on me, and that will come out in my speech sometimes. The first characteristic is grit. Love that word, grit. Angela Duckworth, who's a psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania, she's researched this topic, and this is what she has to say about grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for long-term goals. It's sticking with your future, day in and day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. Those are her words. I think of you as being tenacious and committed. When you encounter a rock wall, you just take up rock climbing. When you don't get what you want, you realize that what you did get was experience, and you learn from that for the next time. A second characteristic is resilience. Resilience is what I'm reminded of when I think of what Ernest Hemingway said in his book, A Farewell to Arms. The world breaks everyone, and many are strong at the broken places. Resilience is the capacity to withstand stress and catastrophe. It's the capacity to bounce back. 
We're all born with innate resilience, but some people develop the capacity for resilience, making them especially strong and flexible as they navigate their way through life. They do this by developing all of the traits associated with being resilient, such as being socially competent. People usually like resilient people. They gravitate toward them because they can express themselves well, and they listen, and they have empathy and compassion and a sense of humor. They usually have good critical thinking and creative thinking skills, and they're autonomous and have a sense of purpose. A third quality, self-efficacy, as some of my psych students here know, is one of my favorite psychological terms. It's at the heart of Albert Bandura's social cognitive theory. And basically, what it means is knowing what you need to do and being able to do it. Think about it. Think about how many of you people know who go through life and they, they don't even have an idea of what to do. They know that they're bored or depressed or angry or anxious, but they have no idea what to do. And so they have a tendency sometimes to eat more, drink more, drug more, game more, sex more, porno more, gamble more, shop more, all of our addictions that we do to distract ourselves from what's really going on. But sometimes, even when they know what to do, oh, so I'm sorry. So sometimes they do know what to do. They know that what, what I need to do is I need to go back to school. I need to quit this dead-end job and do something else with my life that has meaning. I need to get out of this relationship. I need to make some new friends. I need to bust a move and get off the couch, go for a walk, eat less. But sometimes even when they know what to do, they still can't do it, or they can't do it consistently enough to make a difference. So people with high self-efficacy, they know what they need to do, even if sometimes it's admitting they have no idea what to do and they need to get some help. And always when I talk about this, I think about this former student of mine. This is just a couple terms ago. I was walking down the hall over here in Tabor. She was way at the end of the hall, all by herself. And all of a sudden, she's like her early 40s. She's down there, she's kind of by herself. And all of a sudden, she just goes, Woo! And I go up to her and I say, Hey, what, what's going on? She goes, I finally get math. <laughs> I'm like, yay! Well, what did you do? What made the difference? She said, I finally went and asked for some help. I'm saying, honey, good for you. That is where it starts. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so we need to ask for help. Sometimes we go online, we go in and ask somebody, whatever. Sometimes we just need to say, I'm lost. Slip me a note, get me on the path. What do I need to do? So people with high self-efficacy know what they need to do and they can do it, they can make it happen. And so how do they do that? How do you achieve high self-efficacy? You do it by setting high but achievable goals. So, okay, so what does that mean? It means you can kind of just break it down and you can reach up high enough, whether it's physically, academically, emotionally, just that little goal that, yeah, I can do that with a little stretch, a little help, yeah, whoop, and you kind of stair-step yourself up there. Now, ideally, we learn that when we're kids. Ideally, that's modeled to us by healthy parents, healthy teachers, healthy people in our lives. You guys know, and I'm gonna do a little plug for Psych 215 Human Development. If you've taken a human development class, you learn that, right? You learn that at every stage of development, I mean, if you're an aware parent, teacher, educator, whatever, you, you know that your kid is capable physically of this, or their brain's capable of this, or a mo and you just raise the bar a little bit higher for them, right? You help them up stair step them up. But again, many of us, we didn't have that. We didn't even get close. But the good news with, um, with this is that it's never, ever too late in your life to reparent yourself. You can teach yourself that. You can start today setting high, achievable goals that will give you a sense of self-esteem, self-efficacy that just takes you up to the next step. And that's a pretty cool way to get through life, to learn and pass it on and live a life that you believe in. 
So, so far we've talked about grit, resilience, high self-efficacy, and I observe these qualities every day in my students. The fourth and last quality that I want to discuss is discipline. Lots of scholars and clinicians talk about this, but one of my favorite discussions of this characteristic is from the book, The Road Less Traveled, by the renowned psychiatrist M. Scott Peck. The whole first section of this book is entitled Discipline. It knocked me out many years ago when I read it for the first time, and I've read it many times since. But he elaborates on this quality in a way that I can only begin to aspire to. But in a nutshell, his four tools of discipline are delayed gratification, accepting responsibility, dedication to truth and reality, and balancing. And I'd like to just quickly run through these four qualities, these four tools. So delayed gratification, we kind of know what that means, right? You do the work first, you get the reward later. We learn to study or put some time into that paper before we go off with our friends or family or do what it is that we want to do. We learn to save up our money before we buy something um, rather than slapping down a credit card when we can't afford it. We learn to move a little more and eat a little less so we have the reward of living in a healthy body. And again, ideally, we learn this in childhood but if you didn't, again, it's never too late to reparent yourself, to talk to yourself differently, to adapt, adopt different behaviors, to make a difference in your life for yourself and for those you care about, for your kids. The second thing is taking responsibility. So think of this on a continuum. At one end, you've got people who take way too much responsibility. They're always worried about everybody else's problems, they're focusing on everybody else's problems and not spending any time on themselves. They usually say they're sorry a lot, even when there's nothing to be sorry for. And at the other end of the continuum, we have people who, it's never their problem. It's always somebody else's problem. They never say they're sorry. It's, 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 it's never their fault. And ideally, you're in that middle ground somewhere. We call this having healthy boundaries, right? Where you know what's your responsibility. You're clear on that and you can Say no to responsibility that's not yours. The third thing, the third tool of discipline of, of PEX is dedication to truth and reality. And this is actually kind of complicated and it's beyond what I can say here in very much depth, but essentially it means committing to not lying to yourself or other people in big or small ways. So it doesn't mean being brutally honest with other people, but it means authentic, being authentic speaking your truth, doing it with integrity and compassion for the people that you're dealing with. And there's also situations in which you need to withhold the truth, and he's got a whole kind of way of talking about the criteria for this that's pretty amazing to me, but it's worth reflecting upon and thinking about and aspiring to. And in my own experience, just having that in your consciousness and trying to go that road uh, can be transformative. So I have to say, when I read this book the first time and I went through these first three qualities, these first three tools of discipline, delayed gratification, accepting responsibility, dedication to truth and reality, I got to the end of that section and I was just like, well, yeah, in an ideal world, but who is this guy? I mean, who lives like that? I mean, that is way too much work and he, he's just asking too much of normal human beings. But now, then I got to the section on balancing. And now I want to read the words of M. Scott Peck because I've tried to do this in my own words and I just can't do it justice. By now, it must be clear that this exercise of discipline is demanding, complex, and requires both flexibility and judgment. To be organized and efficient, we must delay gratification and keep an eye on the future. Yet to live joyously, we must also possess the capacity when it's not destructive, to live in the present and act spontaneously. To be free people, we must assume total responsibility for ourselves, but in doing so, we must possess the capacity to reject responsibility that isn't truly ours. Courageous people must continually push themselves to be completely honest, yet they must also possess the capacity to withhold the whole truth when it's appropriate. Balancing is the discipline that gives us flexibility extraordinary flexibility is required for successful living in all spheres of activity. 
So all of these qualities that I've discussed, grit, resilience, high self-efficacy, and discipline, they all overlap to some degree. In my experience, successful PCC students, and I'm talking about you again. I've got several of my students here. You demonstrate one or more of these characteristics on a regular basis. And hopefully, you'll continue to go on and expand and develop these qualities, which will enhance your ability to live meaningful, creative, and productive lives. And you will, and you are, passing these qualities on, modeling them to your children, your students, your tribe, the world. You can repeat history or you can change it. We're in between Mother's Day and Father's Day. And if you've been fortunate enough to receive a exposure to a lot of the qualities that I've been talking about from your parents, other healthy adults in your life, teachers, mentors, whomever, find as many ways as you can to thank them, to acknowledge them for the gifts that they've given you. If you didn't receive much, or any exposure to these qualities, start teaching them to yourself and applying them in your life today. Be the person you want to be starting today. Try to do a little bit better job of it tomorrow. Use your brain, but lead with your heart. I acknowledge all of you and the amazing lives you're living and the work that you're doing. Thank you.